Hello and welcome to Who Gets Ahead, the podcast series where we'll talk about what we are doing to increase social economic diversity at senior levels in financial and professional services across the UK and why we need to do it. I'm your host, Michael Barrington Hibbert. We have a vision for equity of progression, where high performance is valued over fit and polish. Over the course of this series, we'll be joined by senior representatives from across financial and professional services who are all involved with the government commissioned Social Economic Diversity Task Force led by the City of London Corporation. For more information on the task force, please visit www.cityoflondon.gov.uk forward slash who gets ahead where you can sign up to the newsletter. Today on Who Gets Ahead, we're joined by Peter Scotts, who is a task force member of Workstream 3. Peter is also the EMEA managing partner of Norton Rose Fulbright. A very warm welcome to you, Peter. Well, Peter, I'm really keen to, to start at the beginning in terms of your background, where you're from, where you went to school, because I'm really keen to understand what your drivers were to be involved in the social economic diversity workforce. Sure, Michael. Well, look, let me start by saying my, mine is not a rags to riches story. Uh, my parents ran a village post office. Mm-hmm. I went to the local primary school in the village. I then went to a mixed comprehensive school in Lincoln uh, before going to university to study law at Leicester. So growing up, we were we were comfortably off. Um, I certainly didn't feel as though doors were closed to me because we couldn't afford things. Uh, but that's, of course, not to say my upbringing didn't affect my career path because, because it absolutely did. Um, and there are a couple of actually you know, important decisions early on in my career that I, I'd highlight. And the first was my choice of university. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got straight A's at GCSE. Uh, I ended up getting straight A's at A-level two. But I I just had this sense that Oxford and Cambridge, you know, they weren't for people like me. And my school didn't do anything to challenge that view at all. Uh, in fact, it was quite the opposite. They pretty much confirmed that was right. So I, I didn't apply to either. Uh, and the second when I was at university was that I decided to go down the route of becoming a solicitor rather than a barrister, in part at least, because I, I found that route so much more financially secure, just lots more training contracts on offer uh, than, than pupillages, the financial support that you got through your studies and then as a junior lawyer at one of the big city firms, so much more attractive than joining the bar. Um, I can still remember, you know, how staggeringly high those starting salaries seem to be. And uh, it made a big difference to me to know that I would be self-sufficient straight out of university. Um, it, it has to be said in hindsight, I've no doubt that I'm better suited as a solicitor than I would have ever been as a barrister. But <laughs> those financial factors right back at the start of my career did, did play a part in influencing that decision. Um, Peter, I, I really do want to, to go back to, to the village in Lincolnshire, to your mum and dad, um, postmasters in a small village. Talk to me about your role models, because again, you've, you've spoken... Um, eloquently about getting all A's at GCSEs. But talk to me about work ethic, because again, running a post office is a very, very demanding job. So really keen to understand where your role models at that age came from in terms of work ethic application. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, to a large extent, although I might not have realised it at the time, of course, it, it, it came from my parents and mm-hmm. seeing them run their own business. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can't remember the times, uh, you know, my, my parents were ill, for example, taking time off work. Uh, you know, if, if they were ill, there wasn't anyone to open the shop, uh, do the mail work. And so, you know, I, I was involved to an extent in, in, uh, in the business. In fact, I could probably say uh, it's the only time nepotism has played a part. My dad did help me get a, <laughs> a, a posting job, a relief posting job uh, during, during the summer holiday uh, mm. one, one year when I was back from university. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, that, that was very valuable to sort of, uh, I suppose, to see how, how my parents sort of ran the business. And uh, it, it was interesting, actually, at school, uh, there was an opportunity to get involved in a young enterprise uh, sort of uh, 
competition and mm -hmm. HSBC uh, sponsored that competition and uh, you know it's I've often reflected on this because I got to know the local branch manager at HSBC through that process and that gave me perhaps my first insight into the opportunities beyond Lincoln and uh, you know to those big businesses that perhaps sponsor local initiatives like Young Enterprise I, I would just say uh, whilst you can't necessarily measure the impact you're having uh, in terms of direct financial return it does play a really valuable role uh, in, in a sort of broader societal sense. Now you've been with the firm for 24 years and again you, you've thrived academically um, you mentioned you come from a humble but I think a very rich background in terms of work experience and um, ethics demonstrated by, by your parents. But can you talk to our listeners about that first time that you joined the, the firm and you're, you're around the water cooler and people are talking about the ski trip or going across to experience some things that perhaps you have not experienced. How did you deal with that, Peter? Well, um, I suppose I, I, I quickly uh, came to realise, you know, when I started my training contract that, you know, I, I felt like I could hold my own in the in, in that workplace, um, you know, with with colleagues, with solicitors at other law firms, with with clients as well. And uh, so, you know, it's not a situation where I felt that I, I didn't fit in right. although it's interesting you talk about the ski trip and and the big <laughs> uh, concern i had going in was that i couldn't play golf and this really <laughs> worried me uh, because i thought i had this sort of conception that you know business was done on the golf course and right. i would miss out on the opportunity to develop client relationships because i couldn't play golf and i suppose the one thing i would i i would sort of say to my younger self there is that you know, don't worry about that. I, I think I've once been asked by a client to join their golf day and they weren't remotely offended when I confessed that my limit was uh, was was crazy golf. And that's uh, <laughs> that's about it. Um, so it, it but it is, you know, to your point about skiing, you know, I, I, I've only been skiing sort of twice and they were in my early 30s. Uh, and there were, you know, there are a lot of people, of course, who've, who've learned to ski at a young age and, uh, you know, are really proficient. So, you know, opportunities to go skiing now, I, I feel that uh, I can't really uh, participate in having only enjoyed sort of two weeks uh, skiing where I appreciated the apres ski rather more than the actual sure. ski. Sure. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pivot slightly now because to, to really talk about the, the Social Economic Diversity Task Force. But before I do that, you, you've indicated that you've been able to adapt pretty quickly in a workplace um, in terms of the golf, the, the the skiing, and making sure that you're being included in those discussions. So do you not think, with the start that you had, the upbringing that you had, hasn't impacted the, the pace of your career? Now, I appreciate you are a senior managing partner. You've been in the city for 24 years. But do you think if your personal circumstances were slightly different in terms of an Oxford or Cambridge um, educated professional, that you perhaps would have um, accumulated more success in a shorter time play, frame? Well, I think it, I mean, I think it does come down to, to sort of confidence. And, you know, I suppose I was fortunate in my early career that I worked with a partner who, you know, was, was great at instilling confidence. Mm -hmm. um, she was a, a, a new partner um, at the firm, uh, incredibly busy and very, very good at bringing on, uh, you know, her team and making them feel valued. And so, you know, straight out of training and qualifying into uh, a busy litigation team, I had a really good role model um, in terms of, you know, bolstering my, my confidence. And mm -hmm. I quickly came to realise that, you know, the law, uh, despite some of those inbuilt, let's say, uh, you know, perhaps prejudices around, uh, you know, social background and, and, and others is also an area where you can, uh, you know, get on and succeed uh, by, you know, the talent that you can bring to bear, provided you've got the right level of support and that you're being, I suppose, nurtured to bring out your authentic true self and, and you're not trying to pretend to be someone you're not, uh, because I think, you know, clients and, and colleagues sort of see through that. And, and, and with that last point, Peter, about being your true authentic self. Um, how long have you felt comfortable talking about your upbringing in Lincoln? Because again, many of the task force members that we've spoken to 
um, who are established and very senior to be very open and transparent with you. It's, it's a new phenomenon. It's only been the last sort of few years that they felt comfortable talking about their humble beginnings. So when, when was that um, moment for you, Peter? Well, that's, that's very interesting you say that, Michael, because I, I would say it's only really since I took on the managing partner role and uh, diversity in all its different manifestations, including social mobility, which is really the, the one strand of diversity I can you know, more personally directly relate to. Um, it, it's become clear that, you know, it's important to have role models that do speak about their background and not assume uh, that people sort of just know all, the, all that sort of backstory that you have. And, you know, I suppose I would say growing up and, and sort of throughout my career, um, you know, my, my background, I never really felt was particularly relevant. Uh, you know, clients, uh, you know, might be might be a little bit interested in in a bit of you know your your backstory, but but not in any great detail. And so, you know, you're judged essentially on your your capability, your experience, your competence, yeah. mm -hmm. and your background doesn't directly come into play. Uh, but then, when you take on a leadership role, uh, it's really important, I think, for uh, junior people to see uh, and hear about that backstory. We've got a feature on our internal uh, internet, uh, which is called Weekend Takeaway. And uh, each weekend, there is a backstory shared about partners. And it is fascinating wow. to see the variety of stories that people share through that. And, and they're always our most popular red item on our, on our uh, intranet. And what did you do last weekend, Peter? <laughs> what did I do last week? It was quite a boring weekend, okay. it has to be said. <laughs> so so we, we spoke about Norton Rose, Paul Brights. I understand that you've launched a social mobility employee network called Advance. What has the firm learned from that experience? So uh, look, Advance uh, was a, a network that we only launched uh, relatively recently, just uh, sort of two years or so ago. And again, what it's, uh, what it's really brought to the fore is the importance that we've just been talking about, sharing uh, role model sort of stories and for people uh, being able to see and appreciate the variety of, of uh, people that we have within our organisation at all levels. And, and this was really brought home to me just uh, a few weeks ago. I was up in Newcastle visiting our office there just earlier this year and one of our new apprentices came up to me uh, and they told me that just hearing from people on our advanced network had confirmed to them that they they really had a future with us and, and just within the law more broadly. And I think it's hard to measure, you know, the direct impact that that can have. But again, the visible role models is really important. The, the other sort of component of advance is, of course, it's been a really, I think, valuable uh, sort of group to bring a focus to bear on our actual policies and initiatives. So. Uh, for example, Advance has been a driving force behind our apprenticeship model. Uh, we've just this last year recruited 15 new apprentices as both paralegals and solicitors wow. in Newcastle and London. And, you know, I, I don't know that we would have uh, moved uh, as quickly were it not for uh, the, the analysis and the lobbying that the Advance Network sort of uh, brought to bear internally. May I ask, and that's fascinating, thank you for sharing, but what, what was the interview process like for, for the candidates in those regions? Because again, if we look at coming from London, um, um, the, the experiences may be slightly different. So what was the interview process like? Was it more inclusive and more reflective of the regions in which you were recruiting from? So it's right to say, yeah, I mean, Newcastle for us has been an office where we've seen exponential growth. Mm -hmm. and. It's uh, you know primarily people uh, who who obviously often have have uh, you know grown up in the northeast, maybe gone away to university, maybe not, uh, but then often come back uh, you know come back home. And uh, the the um, the culture within the Newcastle office, I think, is a is a really positive, vibrant one. Mm. Uh, you know, it's 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 been a very successful office for us. And to your point about you know recruiting people that fit. I remember, you know, just five years ago, we launched the office. Uh, it was a rented Regis office with, I think, six or seven people there. <laughs> and, you know, within five years, we're at over sort of 220 wow, people. Incredible. Uh, so really, really grown. But the one uh, thing that I know that the office has been very successful in doing is generating a sort of challenge, of, a, a culture of challenge. 
Uh, people were sort of that come into the office are encouraged to sort of challenge the status quo. Uh, and I think that's sort of imbued through the interviewing uh, and recruitment process that, you know, people joining are actively encouraged to be active participants from the moment they join. And I think a challenge we have in a, in a more traditional business like our law firm, uh, you know, and, and the, most of the legal team sits uh, in London, is that, uh, you know, all too often you, you fit into a hierarchy and you have to work your way up. And it's only when you get to the most senior levels that you can start to actually change the way the business operates. And, you know, that, that uh, you know, has some advantages. But generally speaking, I think it does stifle innovation if you're not at all, you know, if you're not careful. And, and I think on that note, I'm, I'm really keen to talk about the parallels between what you've done at Norton Rose Fulbright's and, and also around the social economic diversity workforce, because this was driven by the City of London. Um, we've got a number of London-based headquartered firms, but it's really empowering to see the work that your organisation is doing outside of the regions. So tell me about what motivated you to get involved in this, this task force, Peter? Because um, I wanted to, I suppose, make uh, a contribution to increase the uh, level of, of social mobility. And I suppose I had a bit of a sense that uh, rather than increasing, social mobility seemed to me to be to be stalled or, or even going backwards. And, you know, when I joined Norton Rose Fulbright back as a, a trainee in the late 90s, I could only imagine that social mobility was co would continue to you know, to develop uh, and that people from, let's say, ordinary backgrounds like mine, with no particular connections to the City of London or the law, would get, you know, greater access to, to those opportunities. And, you know, if anything, I would say over, you know, the period of my career, I, I've probably seen that progress, as I say, at least stall, if not go backwards. So I saw this task force as an opportunity to, you know, as now a more senior, uh, you know, uh, leader in our firm uh, to to sort of do what I can to to reverse that trend and to promote more social mobility in the future. Fascinating, because I understand that you're on Workstream 3, which is developing the business case and productivity analysis. And given the two examples that you've provided for us, the talent is clearly there. Newcastle, five years ago, a rented office in Regis, a room, I suspect, and now over 220 employees in the region, which is an amazing statistic. In terms of other sort of data trends that you're looking to incorporate into this analysis, what other trends have you seen across the UK to really help change the dial with other senior leaders, not just at law firms, but UK business in general, to, to adopt this initiative? Well, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of why businesses should focus on this, um, you know, the, the single most important factor is that uh, we know that diverse teams produce better solutions, certainly to complex problems uh, than, than sort of one dimensional uh, teams. And so, you know, I, I would say simply, you know, diverse teams are, are better teams and so better for your person, you know, your individual business, as well as for, you know, the wider economy. Um, certainly from a, a legal perspective, we know our clients value and demand diversity when it comes to, you know, teams. People with different backgrounds, different experiences, different perspectives, really important uh, when you're looking at complex problems that don't have a simple, you know, a simple solution. And, you know, that's, of course, true across all types of diversity. And I think those from a less advantaged so socioeconomic uh, background bring a particular perspective, maybe a, a set of experiences that are often very different from you know, others in the team. And I think that can be really valuable to the effectiveness of the team. So that's, I'd say, the direct answer. But I think there's also quite an interesting indirect answer. And it, it goes to the importance of diversity, again, more more broadly. But, you know, we know that when it comes to attracting and retaining the brightest and the best people to work for you as an organisation, you know, people demand to see diversity in their in their prospective employer. And, you know, I think to an extent that's always been true, but especially so with the millennial generation, Gen Z, who are, we know selecting which organisation they work for, not, not so much on the size of the salary, although, of course, that's a, an important factor for everyone. 
but actually by reference to one organization's values and uh, you know a proven track record of improving diversity and inclusion is a prerequisite to businesses that want to attract the best people and if you're attracting the best people of course you're enhancing your prospects of of succeeding as a business so i think to gain that competitive advantage um, you know both to serve your clients directly but also to attract the brightest and the best people to work with you that commitment to diversity increasingly including socio-economic diversity is a real prerequisite thank you for listening to this episode of who gets ahead and thank you to peter scott for being with us today join us next time where i'll be joined by task force member chasey garrard to discuss how organizations are getting involved and the task force values being integrated throughout the UK. For more information on the Social Economic Diversity Task Force, please type the City of London Who Gets Ahead into your search bar to find out our webpage and sign up to our newsletter to stay up to date. On social media, please visit City of London Corporation on LinkedIn. On Twitter, it's City of London. And on YouTube, The Global City. Who Gets Ahead is produced by trading and education firm OSTC. A special thank you for your kind support on this series. Find out more at OSTC on Twitter and OSTC Limited on LinkedIn.